Maitland Godfrey, retired colonel and old friend. Now, I don't think he ever really forgave his superiors for calling the whole thing off. Sorry? The war. The Second World War. No, he was thoroughly enjoying himself. He was decorated many, many times and uh, was responsible for the slaughter of literally millions of the foe. So naturally, uh, when the time came to wind operations up, I think he felt very short-changed, you know. There was a lot of unfinished business to do, and he felt that he was the man to do it. However, that was not to be. Uh, well, after the war, of course, he was involved in a consultative capacity in various skirmishes, uh, Aden, Korea, Vietnam, and so forth. But nothing that really compared to the real thing. So I think he became dissatisfied, and with dissatisfaction, I think, came restlessness, and ultimately, I think, uh, idleness. Now, in my book, when a man becomes idle, he becomes a nuisance. Robin Parry Whitmore, great nephew. Yes, well, the actual site of the dig was on the upgrading of the motorway between Folkestone and Dover. And um, we were working in this particular hole for an underwater pump for the motorway and came across some Roman artifacts and uh, coins, or pottery, or, you know, oddments and so on and so forth. And um, anyway, Keith suddenly saw the digger go through a plank of wood and uh, he thought, oh my gosh, you know, but uh, of course you don't think to yourself, well, you know, this could be a Bronze Age boat. But anyway, after five minutes of furious digging, um, he suddenly shouted, it is a Bronze Age boat. And uh, so, of course, we came running over with our trowels and uh, helped him out for about half an hour, which was very uncomfortable because in places it was about five feet full of water. And um, anyway, after um, a, a, you know, a while, it was clear it was what a Bronze Age boat. And... Um, the contractors were very, very kind because they let us carry on for a further week. And during that time, I can tell you, we worked like demons. <laughs> <clears throat> Terry Stevens, who works for the London Water Board. Yes, yeah, so we're digging up the road like, and uh, very often you get a lot of water and uh, people think there's an underground stream or a river or something like that, but uh, there ain't, but, you know, we just put them right like... So anyway, this particular time, uh, we was working very close to where the field marshal lived, bottom of his garden, matter of fact, and uh, we must have put a lot of pressure on because uh, a big gush come up, you know, right up in the middle of his garden, like, and he must have been well gutted because uh, he came rushing out in what I assumed at the time was his wife's negligee, and uh, he looked like he wanted to hit someone because he had this big bull whip in his hand, like, and he came running down the garden, and we are on the other side of the fence, you know, looking really red-faced and sheepish-like, you know, and uh, he gets to the middle of the garden, and uh, he sees us on the other side of the fence, like, and suddenly he, he changes his mind, and uh, he ran back in the house, and, uh, well, yeah, that was the first and last time I think we ever saw him, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Trudy Wilcox. So she says, are you going to take rocks? Yes, says, no. And she says, why? I says, I'll tell you why. Because Bergerac's on at 8 o'clock, that's why. And she says, oh, you daft cow. It finishes at 9 o'clock. We don't get down to Roxy till half past 11 after pubs chuck out. So I says, don't call me a daft cow, you dozy pig. How can I go disco dancing after that? I've got to have time to think about it. I've got time to cogitate on it. Anyway, she called me a daft cow again, so I thumped her in the gob and told her to get a life. That were an expression I picked up from Bergerac. Who is great, that John Nettles. Sorry? No, but my brother did, cos he were in army. He were in show where he were dressed as a lady, like, and field marshal saw him and got him transferred and made him his Batman, which I thought that was really funny, because my brother's name's Robin, see? <laughs> anyway, he took him skiing, paid for his driving lessons, bought him shorts, all sorts. But, uh, no, it all fizzled out when uh, Robin got engaged to Julie. Really, but he still got a Christmas card every year. Oh, it was beautiful. It had uh, that robin on the outside, and uh, on the inside it said, I still glow when I think of you. And I think that's fantastic. I think that, you know, it's like poetry. Whereas Bergerac's more action, you know. <laughs> Tony Lucia, a friend. 
Yeah, so I've done this commercial for Levi's, right? I go in the laundry and I take all my clothes off, like, I mean, the whole lot. So I'm there, starters, and uh, people are, like, well shocked and stuff. But anyway, Adrian Noble, who's, like, the owner of the RSC, he must have seen my bum on telly and thought to himself, well, I mean, like, millions of other people have seen my bum and all, so if I get him in my theatre, I'll get their bums and my seats, like, you know what I mean? So anyway, he rang me up and said, you know, did I want to play Hamlet? And I thought, yeah, I'll have some of that, like. And I uh, got my mum's social worker to read it to me. And uh, when she finished, I thought, well, yeah, I mean, that is like, well, me, you know what I mean? So anyway, we rehearsed it and that. And first night come, and it was like, it was packed. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it was like girls, like wall to wall. I mean, it was screaming and shouting. They was well out of order, mind, you know. I mean, it's kind of like mayhem, you know what I mean? So anyway, the next day, mind, come. And they're clearing up in the theatre, and uh, and uh, all, and they found like all the seats, like r r where the girls had been sitting, like they were s s wet, so so for saturated, you know what I mean? And it's, you know what it was. I mean, it was young girls like we we, you know. So of course they had to unbolt them all and uh, take them down the laundry air, get them cleaned, and uh, I thought to myself, and now that is dramatic irony, personified. Helen St. John Freeman, great niece. My husband was transferred from active duty to a desk job at the Admiralty. John T. Palmerston rang to say that he had secured a simply super flat in Admiralty Arch. I was cock a hoop because it was the year of the royal wedding, do you see? And I had visions of seeing the whole thing from the luxury of my flat. However, when we arrived, I was terribly disappointed to find none of the windows actually overlooked the route of the procession. So Godwin, my husband, put his arms around me and said, now look, don't be a silly. And he pointed to a little window in the lavatory, which was rather high up, but if one stood on tippy toes on something, one could get a perfectly good view. So anyway, the great day arrived, and, uh, and there I was, standing on tippy toes, and with Godwin's very, very expensive camera, clicking away, and oh, the pageantry, and the colours, and the flag waving, it was simply too superb for words. And Diana looked absolutely wonderful. I can honestly say that in 30 years of marriage, it really was the most exciting experience of my life. And I think I shall be grateful to that room forever. And, um, and I shall certainly treasure that stool forever as well. <laughs> mm. Derek Jolly, cab driver. Oh, yeah, I had him in the back of the cab, all right. Drunk as a lord, he'd be. He'd ring up from his club, like. He'd say, hello, is that A&B cabs? George would answer the phone. He'd say, here, yeah, Derek, I think it's for you. It's Monty, cos he always asked for me by name, you see. I'd be down there in a flash, cos even when he was as tight as Rudolf Nureyev's jockstrap, he was always a stickler for punctuality, I'll tell you that now. I'd get down there, I'd say, hello, Mr Bunny, come on, let's get you home. And we'd be up in St John's Wood in about ten minutes or so. I'd knock on the door and Pedro, the Filipino house boy, would answer. He'd take one look at me and say, oh my God, Mr Derek. And he'd raise his eyes to heaven. I says, never you mind that. You get some clothes on and help me get him out the back of the car. So we'd stagger up the steps like an indoors. What a beautiful house. Wonderful it was. Yeah, thick carpet, nice wallpaper and flowers. Flowers everywhere. And uh, anyway, he'd say to me, well, how much is that? I say, that's five, uh, Mr. Pedro, and he gives me ten. I say, no, 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 that's all right. And he says, no, look, if he finds out I give you any less than that, he'll be furious. So I says, well, if you're sure, Mr. Pedro, he says, of course I'm sure, off you go. And you know that happened every single time without fail. Every single time. He was a bloody gentleman in the main run, I'll tell you that now. <laughs>